I'm actually going to talk a little bit about Kurds today. Um, I had promised that I would not use my husband's phrase that the Kurds are always in the way, um, but I, I can't help it. There are about 28 million Kurds. They are spread primarily across four countries, Iraq, Syria, um, Iran, and Turkey. And the reason for that was 99 years ago, the Sykes-Picot Agreement. And you know that, but at that point, 99 years ago, the British and the French were dividing the world into spheres of influence, not borders, although they became the borders pretty much of the Middle East that we know today, but spheres of influence. And the Kurds had no one to speak for them in the sense of creating an influence for the Kurds. The Jews were a little bit luckier at that time. There was Jewish representation in Europe, and the Jews could make a pitch for the need to recognize Jewish nationalism. The Kurds had no one to speak for them. So they ended up being divided among countries, not because anybody, the Russian, uh, the French or the British disliked the Kurds. They simply didn't pay any attention to them. So for 99 years, you have the Kurds being bystanders in other people's history. And now you have, across the Middle East, the end of Sykes-Picot. The borders are beginning to disintegrate um, into constituent parts. But the Kurds, again, are bystanders because the people who matter in the Middle East right now are not interested in the Kurds. At Sykes-Picot, you had the British and the French, and you had the concurrence of the Russians. Today, you have uh, Turkey, Iran, Saudi Arabia with the active assistance of the United States. And none of them want to change the Sykes-Picot orders. And I know there are people who think history is irrelevant, but it isn't. We are still playing that game of 99 years ago, and there are people who do not want to change those borders. Part of the reason is, of course, oil. But that's not very difficult. If you have new leadership, you will have new oil contracts, and, and that's not a big problem. More importantly, people have become spooked by the idea of vacuums and what happens when you leave a vacuum in a place, and particularly the United States is spooked. We did Libya, and nobody wants to be responsible for the next Libya. We got rid of a government that was admittedly not a great government, although it certainly was not as bad as what followed it, and the vacuum has been horrendous. It is true that in the latter part of the 20th century, you've seen Yugoslavia disintegrate into its constituent parts. Uh, Czechoslovakia had a divorce, Sudan, devolved into its constituent parts. Um, two of the three were really bloody, messy, and ugly. And no one wants bloody, messy, and ugly, but it is too late. You already have, in Iraq and in Syria, bloody, messy, and ugly. The United States, in the face of that, has not been willing to talk about what it wants to see in the region. It stands for the old borders, and it will tell you only what it doesn't want to see. It doesn't want to see ISIS in Iraq, it doesn't want to see uh, Iraq break up, and it doesn't want to put American boots on the ground. And it wants to consider Syria to be two separate problems. One is a problem of ISIS, and the other is the problem of the civil war of Syria. Um, and by maintaining those kinds of fictions, that you can do this without boots, that's, that Syria has two separate wars going on inside of it, instead of a single disintegrative war, you can pretend that the boundaries will stay the same. What do we want? Is it possible that the United States really believes that Iran is a force for stability in the region? Um, if you look at it through the prism of the U.S.-Iran nuclear talks, no. It's just a sop to Iran to keep the talks going. They don't really believe that Iran is a force for stability. On the other hand, if they really think that the region can be divided into a Sunni caliphate run by Turkey and a Shiite caliphate run by Iran and that that would produce stability regardless of the borders, maybe they do want this. Maybe they do really think that it's a good idea to have Iran control territory from Iran through Iraq, through Syria, through Lebanon to the Mediterranean Sea. Um, they won't tell you. I'm not sure that they know, but if they knew, they wouldn't tell you. But in any case, talking to the Kurds directly um, would imply that you are willing to look at a breakup of Iraq into its constituent parts. And if you're willing to look at a breakup of Iraq, the Turks are terrified that you might be willing to look at a breakup of Turkey or a breakup of Syria, or heaven forbid, a breakup of Iran, which would be really interesting because Persians only constitute about 40% of the Iranian population, so, so there is room for a breakup of Iran as well. We don't want to do it. We adamantly don't want to do it. We are about to be forced, however, because the um, Syrian war is reaching, I think, an end point. Syria as a country no longer exists. The Assad government holds about 25% of the country other people hold the other 75%. Could be ISIS that emerges. 
um, probably ISIS that emerges, which if the United States goal is to degrade and defeat ISIS, will make it almost impossible. If they are sitting in Damascus, even if we put boots on the ground, which we are unlikely to do, we are not going to invade and hold Damascus. We are not going to do it with air power. There's no way we're dropping one out of, one out of four of our sorties are dropping bombs at the moment in Iraq where it's simple. It's relatively simple because it's relatively open. If you look at the city of Damascus, you don't want to drop bombs on it in any event. Um, so Syria is just about over. Now we're going to have Libya in Syria. We're going to have competing factions looking for the best way to control bits of territory that correspond to their ethnic and religious interests. Iraq, Iraq would be over, too, if it wasn't for us, if it wasn't for the coalition. Um, we are determined to keep Iraq in one piece. It's not clear why, but we are. The best I can come up with is because Turkey wants it that way and because Iran wants it that way. And we are not willing to express an opinion. Um, Iran doesn't really care about the borders of Iraq at all. Iran only has a territorial, transnational territorial interest. They want to get from where they are to where they want to be. Their biggest investment is in Hezbollah in Lebanon. The best way to support that investment is through Damascus International Airport. The best way to do that is to fly over Iraqi airspace. So Iran's interest is really, can we get to Damascus so that we can support Hezbollah in Lebanon? If Assad falls, the investment is lost. You could fly into Beirut International Airport if you try offloading weapons in Beirut International Airport. The Israelis will consider that an invitation to attack the airport. So it makes life complicated for Iran. It also makes life complicated for Hezbollah. Hezbollah will not survive the downfall of Assad in, the, in its current state. It will have to do something else. Hezbollah has probably lost 1,000 fighters in Syria, which is a huge, huge number. But they're also getting enormous blowback from the Lebanese population. Hezbollah always claimed that it was there to protect the Lebanese from Israel. And now it's clear that what they're there for is to be Iran's arm in Syria. There are some reports that Hezbollah is also in Iraq. Um, Hezbollah will not survive in its current form. So all of this stuff is shaking up now. And what we have essentially said is we don't actually have a position here. We are there at the request of the Baghdad government to help it with air cover which makes us the air arm of the Quds Force in Iran, which is not really a position that the United States ought to want to be in. So coming back to the Kurds, the question is, what can you do under that circumstance? It is crashing down around people. Um, we do not have an end game in mind, at least not an articulated end game in mind. And we have only very limited interests in being there at all. So what do you do for the Kurds? There are, I think, three practical steps, three things that can be done for the Kurds. The first would be to recognize them politically as an ally, as a partner in the fight against ISIS. There was a meeting in Paris this week to discuss Iraq and Syria, and the Kurds were not invited, despite the fact that there are 160,000 or so Kurdish fighters on the ground doing the job. You know, the United States says that we will train about 5,000 moderate Syrian rebels a year. That's 32 years until we catch up to what the Peshmerga is putting on the ground now to fight ISIS. And yet we're willing to make the investment in what we call moderate Syrian rebels. I'm not sure what that means, but we are unwilling to consider the Kurdish and their, and their military forces an ally and a partner in this fight. Got to do better. Um, which means that we have to talk to them directly and not through Baghdad. That's the second thing. Got to talk to them directly. Right now, all the aid that we give them, which is not a whole lot of aid anyway, Money, weapons, everything goes through Baghdad, which means the Kurds probably get, I don't know, 25, 35 percent of what it is that they're meant to get because the rest of it gets taken out in Baghdad. We have to go to them directly. Um, there should be a statement of recognition in the Congress. I mean, that would, that would help if people would put it on the line and say that this is what we want, this is how we see the Kurds. But more importantly, it would be to figure out how to give them military equipment directly. The Turks will not like it, the Iraqis will not like it, and the Iranians will not like it. Uh, but we're really clever. If we decided to do that, we could do that. The Germans and the French do it now. They supply the Kurds directly, and we ought to do it too. Um, so if the first is recognition and the second is direct conversation and, and direct arms to the Kurds, the third would be to figure out how to get Kurds to the United States to talk. It is very hard for Kurds to get a visa to the United States right now. 
State Department is giving visas to every radical Islamic organization you can think of, and its brother, and its cousin, and its, you know, its wife's uncle. So all the radical voices are represented here in Washington, but not only Washington, they go to New York for a conference and Chicago and, and San Francisco and Los Angeles. And those voices are being heard around the United States. The Kurdish voices are not. And they need to be. And so first of all, they need invitations. They need to be invited to testify on the Hill. They need to be invited to conferences. They need to be invited to be people's honored guests because it is much harder for the State Department then to say no to them. Um, there are at least, that I know of, 12 or so Kurdish diplomats whose English is, is very, very good, who are ready to come to the United States at any time. And we need to make it possible for them to come here and do that. Um, the other thing that we need to do for the Kurds actually has less to do with the Kurds and more to do with us. We need to figure out what it is that we want as an end game. We need to figure out what is the optimal outcome, what is an acceptable outcome, and what is the minimal outcome necessary. And we haven't done that. There is some requirement that people sit around in Washington and think. There need to be people who create outcomes and try to figure out how to get to those outcomes. The administration clearly is not going to do it. Somebody has to do it. Somebody has to say when Assad falls or when Iraq devolves into its constituent parts or when the Iranians uh, bring large-scale Iranian forces into Iraq, which is a possibility. They haven't yet. They've been using Shia militias, but the possibility is. And there are Iranian forces now in Syria. They've taken over a lot of the fighting. What do we expect to happen, and how can we help to control that outcome? U.S. interests actually lie with the minority communities in the Middle East. The Israelis first, because the Israelis have a history with us. Uh, they have capabilities. Israelis are, are first among equals, but the Kurds are second. We have allies in the region. We need to lean on our allies and stop trying to pretend that our enemies are our allies. In the case of the Kurds, it's one of the few cases I know where the enemy of my enemy is actually my friend. In most cases in the Middle East, the enemy of my enemy is also my enemy. Here you have a clear example. The enemy of ISIS is the Kurds. They are our friends, and we have to treat them that way. It is not our job to determine the new parameters of the Middle East. It is not our job to create borders for people. We can't do that anyway. But it is our job to find the people with whom we should be working and then work with them and try to preserve them. If we could do that for the Kurds, if we could give them the status of partner and ally, if we could give them weapons directly, if we could ensure that they could come to the United States and be heard, and if we could have a policy that has an end game into which you want the Kurds to buy and the Israelis to buy in and the Berbers in North Africa to buy in and all the other minority communities in the Middle East, that will be the beginning of wisdom for the United States. That's where I think we ought to go. Thank you. <clears throat> Shoshana, thank you. That was uh, superb, as always. Uh, would you uh, elucidate what your thinking is as to what the best case outcome is? I mean, I, I hear you about I think who, the who we should work with. But I think the 2016 elections are probably the best case outcome. Okay. Um, it is not possible to defeat an ideologically driven transnational insurgency, which is what ISIS is still. It's, it's beginning to take on the trappings of an actual government and an actual army, but it's not quite there yet. You can't do that from the air. It is not possible. We proved it in Libya. I mean, we should have known it. We actually proved it in Bosnia and in Kosovo, where the Kosovo Liberation Army, which was not our friend, we, didn't, we weren't talking to them, but we were coordinated with them, so we were in the air and they were on the ground. You can't do it without ground forces. The Kurdish forces are insufficient. So the first thing you have to do is recognize that the strategy you're pursuing won't work. It's not going to work. It would work, it could work, if we were prepared to level whole entire cities from the air to get rid of ISIS, um, as we did to Dresden, as we did to a number of cities in, in Europe in World War II. But that's not the way we fight anymore, and I'm not advocating that we return to that style of fighting. So the first thing is to recognize that it doesn't work. And then you have to have a backup position. And if the backup position is that you separate the Kurds from the rest of Iraq so that they don't get decimated, so that they can come under some U.S. umbrella, then that would also be a wise thing. And the third is that you shore up Israel and you make sure that if Hezbollah decides to prove its bona fides as the resistance against Israel, that Israel has U.S. backing for whatever it needs to do. Saving Iraq, I think you can't. Can I just follow up? Uh, you did not mention Sunni tribes. 
where do they fit into the scheme of things? Where do Sunni tribes fit in? Sunni tribes have been asked to do something that's probably impossible for them. We have asked them to do something probably impossible. It was, in my opinion, never going to work to arm the, the moderate Sunni rebels from the beginning because, first of all, we didn't know who they were. And secondly, moderate is a very relative term. Third, we were started, they were not dentists and doctors. I mean, they were not people that, that rose up from the cities and went out to fight. They were people who had fighting experience. And most of what we now think of as the old moderate Sunni um, rebels were actually al-Qaeda aligned from the beginning. So, so arming them from the beginning was a bad idea. But then on top of that, we said to them, first ISIS, then Assad. And you can't say that. You simply cannot say that. You cannot say, take my enemy first as your enemy and then go deal with your enemy. Assad is dropping barrel bombs on people. He is killing people with chlorine, which contrary to the president's assertion is in fact a chemical weapon. Um, so if you train them, you should not be surprised when they take their training and their weapons and they go over to ISIS, which many of them have done. I don't blame them, frankly. Mm -hmm. They understand that the priority number one is Assad and priority number two is everything else. So I don't think we're gonna field a large Sunni um, army in Syria, uh, because I think we've set it up to take those things and go off and fight their own enemies, which is not our enemy. I, I was actually thinking of the ones in Iraq. In Iraq, if I were a Sunni in Iraq, I'm not sure I would trust me, you know. They did a great job in 2006 and 7 with the U.S. Marines and the U.S. Army standing next to them. Not because they don't have the will to fight. I disagree with Ash Carter. I think they do have the will to fight, and I think they would prefer to have a moderate Iraq. But again, they don't see us as um, necessarily trustworthy allies. If it's a choice between sticking your neck out now and having the United States abandon you again or going with ISIS, if it's a choice between Shiite militias run by Iran and ISIS, I'm not surprised when a lot of those people say, I'm just going to duck my head and I'm not going to fight anybody. I'm not going to fight ISIS. I mean, I have Shiite militias on my, on my backside. Why would I fight ISIS? On the other hand, I can't fight those people because those are the people that Baghdad supports and the U.S. supports, and they'll come and drop bombs on me. So they, again, you put them in an impossible position. And I can't tell you how much I disagree with Ash Carter that they don't want to fight. I don't think that's the problem. They are in between rocks and hard places, and we have left them there. Wasn't he talking about the Iraqi military more than... No, it talks about the tribes. It was the tribes that helped us get rid of al-Qaeda during the surge. No, the no, Iraqi army um, was a good thing. You know, it was, it, it was helpful. We have not really trained the Iraqi army since 2011 until this past year, which means that all the young Iraqi soldiers that came in 2011, 12, 13, 14, and into 15 had no U.S. training. So, again, I'm not surprised when they are not fighting in a way that we think they should have fought. They are not the U.S. Marines. They are a, a young army that has not had U.S. training. The actual circumstances of Ramadi are a little bit unclear, but it is clear that they used enormous suicide bombs, um, which is enough to shake anybody. I don't know if any of you were in Oklahoma City. I wasn't, but I think I would have run. Okay? So imagine 15 or 20 or 25 Oklahoma City-sized bombs and tell me that you would not have left the battlefield. I think it's perfectly understandable that the Iraqi army left the battlefield. Yes. Um, well, I don't do politics, so I can't say anything about what Lindsey Graham has said or, not, or anybody else hasn't said. Um, but your, but your, other point, your other point is a really important one, and this is the reason to arm the Kurds directly, because we know that a large percentage of what we put into Baghdad, whether it's stripped off in Baghdad for people to sell, I mean, the corruption there is, is enormous, or whether it's given to the Iraqi army and it ends up in ISIS's hands, um, it's not getting to the Kurds, and that's another reason to arm your friends directly and not be arming your enemies, you know, through the back door. Ben. Yeah. It looks like the real villain of the piece, your colleague, is Turkey, actually. And in my opinion, 
light of the recent uh, campaign rhetoric by Erdogan that Muslim armies must liberate Jerusalem, why is the U.S. still treating him like an ally in any way? Will be used by our preference for not very good feelings? Um, Erdogan at one point was President Obama's favorite foreign leader, the president said so. The president has not said that lately, and I, I think he's not happy with Erdogan either. But Turkey is a NATO ally, and it raises a really important question. Do you want Turkey inside NATO, where it is obstructionist and obstreperous, or do you want it outside NATO, where it will be obstructionist and obstreperous and probably an ally of China and Russia? So among the thought processes in Washington is don't cut all your ties to Turkey. Make sure that you can still talk to the Turks. They are awful. There is not one Turkish foreign policy initiative, I think, that I know of that I would support. But there are people who are afraid to cut it off entirely. And so the one thing that the Turks want more than anything is to um, maintain control of the Kurds, their own Kurds, and to ensure that the Kurds of northern Iraq do not separate into an independent body. And no one here is going to tell the Turks any different. It's not going to happen. Yes, sir. Uh, You, the first thing you would need to do, I don't think you can do it on the back of the Kurds. I think all the pieces that you've put there are the right pieces, but you can't do it only on the back of the Kurds. You have to cut off access to Iraq and to Syria from Turkey. All these foreign fighters that come to ISIS, that come to the caliphate, all these young girls who, who sell themselves as caliphate brides, they come in through Turkey. It's an 800-mile border. It's hard to patrol but it could be patrolled. And so you have to cut off, first of all, the flow of foreign fighters, number one. Secondly, you have to understand that it's not going to be air power alone that does it. And I don't think, again, I don't think you can do the whole thing on the back of the Kurds. You will need ground forces of some sort that you can rely on. And it either means that we have to do a better job working with the Iraqis, which probably means forward American forces with Iraqi forces, which means boots on the ground. So if you're talking about a turnaround, it's, a, it's 180 degrees. We have to agree that American forces will be on the ground. And that's the only way to do it. By the way, I'm not advocating boots on the ground. I'm not sure that we should be doing it. I'm not sure we can do it. But if you choose to do it, you cannot do it from the air, and you cannot do it only with the Peshmerga. You're going to have to do it with the United States Army or what's left of it. So you're, I think you're right in principle, but I think you have other problems that have to be solved. Anyone else? Shoshana, maybe I could ask you one final question. Um, the piece that you sort of touched on, but that is laced through all of this, of course, is the ideological component. And one of the con considerations that I think we've largely missed is the willingness of people who are perfectly prepared to kill each other over relatively, to our way of thinking, at least fine points of theology, will nonetheless come together to kill infidels. 
out of a shared ideology. So where, what do we do about Iran, I guess is the question what do, what that I wanted you to, about? Iran. Iran. Um, especially against the backdrop of all of the crazy things we're doing with it at the moment. Well, How does it fit into your scheme here? Iran is actually the source of all evil, okay? Um, including ISIS evil. You know, Iran foments Sunni revolution in order to make itself welcome in places. I think, Frank, you might have been one of the first people to say that out loud. Iran wanted to be needed in Iraq. They wanted to have a reason to be supporting the Shiite militias. They wanted to have a reason to have General Soleimani come and visit his forces. So, so yes, there is this, they will, enemies will come together to fight other enemies. Um, just yesterday, the head of the Al-Qaeda-aligned Nusra Front in Syria denounced the ISIS caliphate as illegitimate and said that they are going to destroy the ISIS caliphate. So I don't know if that makes them our friends now, or the enemy of my enemy is my friend, so now the Nusra Front and Al-Qaeda is our friend. But there is infighting and there is outfighting. We're probably not going to do anything to Iran. We've missed that boat. The, the collapse in oil prices, had we been serious about sanctions and serious about using our leverage in a place that we could have used it six months ago was the time. Oil was $42 a barrel. <clears throat> the Iranians need oil at about $119 a barrel to meet their own uh, obligations, both internal and external. Syria is costing them billions every year. Hezbollah has cost them billions. That was the time to do it. We could have collapsed them. I think we're, I think we're past. I think we're past. You cannot, I don't care what they say about snapback sanctions uh, as such. The sanctions are over. You have French companies, you have American companies. Boeing signed the first contract since 1979. Boeing signed a new contract in Iran for um, spare parts for airplanes. Once you have American companies operating in Tehran, not to mention German, French, British, and all the rest, um, your leverage is gone. Now you're in the position of hoping that someday these old people will die and the new people will be better. That's not exactly a policy. But that's where you're left. I thank you for confirming. I had heard that, but not from, not from a Hill source. So yes, the administration wanted to, uh, it's part of the signing bonus. I mean, my understanding always was the administration pushed Boeing to do it. I wasn't trying to dump on Boeing. Thank you. No, neither, neither dump nor defend, but, but what they did was not without government sanction and, and government approval. Well, this again gets to the larger problem of U.S. policy. Everything goes the first, back. The first order with, uh, as you say, the, the source of, if not all, literally all evil, certainly the preponderance of it at the moment. Shoshana, thank you very much. And, and I, I completely agree with your analysis of the importance of helping the Kurds and um, yeah. other minorities, the Baluchis maybe as well in uh, Iran. Absolutely. Um, but this is going to take, as you've indicated, probably new leadership to uh, redraw the map and be willing to live with the consequences of changes that we can't entirely control or even predict. But thank you, as always. Thank you. So glad to have you back. Come back again soon.